I, I used to have terrible days where I couldn't focus and I'd just play Sonic the Hedgehog, I'd play, play <laughs> 80, 80s video games and I'd feel incredibly guilty about it yeah. until I realized that actually it's part of the, it's part of the mechanism of getting your brain <laughs> working. <laughs> yes. I'll start with a very basic question. What was it about the film, the films you're nominated for, that made you want to tell those stories? You want to take that first? Um, sure. <laughs> uh, well, the story of Desmond Doss, the first conscientious objector to win the Medal of Honor, is just uh, such a, uh, an amazing achievement. Um, what this man did, he saved 75 plus American and Japanese soldiers during the course of one of the most violent um, battles in World War II. And he was a pacifist. He didn't even carry a gun. And the idea of, of a man of such principle um, in such a maelstrom, um, I, I just, you know, you, you would tell the story and people would go, well, that can't possibly be. Um, it seemed particularly um, important today. I just thought it was a story that had to be told. Mm -hmm. Um, Go With All the Gifts is a very different proposition from Hacksaw Ridge. It's not based on fact. It's not about a real zombie apocalypse. Really? It's a made up one. Um, but it's, um, I think what attracted me to it was the character of Melanie and that the whole, the whole story grew out of the idea of this little girl who is both a monster and a complete innocent. Hmm. I think something that's similar with both films is they're both from very well established genres but they do something completely different. It could be very easy to fall into the cliches associated with those genres, but you both mm -hmm. kind of very effortlessly avoid that. Was that something you were conscious of when you were writing? Uh, very much so, uh, in my case. Indeed, even the structure of the film is, is a bit different. But mm. Instead of the usual three-act structure, it's a two-act structure. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very, very conscious of the entire genre of war movies, particularly the American style. Mm. Um, and to play against that because yeah. the story itself cuts against the usual tropes of masculinity yeah. and bravery and, uh, and war. Mm. I, I think as far as um, zombie movies go, I, I came in at a very propitious time because we're sort of at um, second stage zombie. All, all of the sort of first wave of, of zombie films were about the outbreak, about the, the apocalypse, the, the, the traumatic breakdown of civilization uh, and the immediate consequences of that. Whereas now, um, you can take that as a given. Mm -hmm. You can play it out in backdrop and do something else, or you can have it be um, history. So we start a generation later, uh, and it's not really about that at all. It's about a world where nature is reclaiming the, the, the spaces that had been human. And it's about a small group of people, main, mainly about this child and the adults around her, mm -hmm. making choices about themselves, their own future. You, you can sort of use the, uh, the, 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 the whole zombie phenomenon as a metaphor for mm. other things. You can use it as a, a jumping off point for other kinds of story yeah. that are not necessarily or essentially horror stories. Yeah. It feels like the, both could have kind of descended into mayhem, but you stuck with the morality of the lead characters and that's kind of what was so unique. Was there any point where uh, an outside influence tried to kind of throw in a few cliches, maybe the studios or, or somebody kind of suggested maybe we add more, something they would say was safe, safer, a safer bet or something? Well, um, you know, Hacksaw had a famously long gestation, 10 years to mm. get to the screen, and, and, and that was entirely in part because of the original studio, mm. which uh, had a very, their whole raison d'entre was that they would, only family movies, uh, so nothing R-rated or, or above, and um, Every person who read the, uh, the screenplay said, oh my God, I want to do this. And then as soon as they learned that they couldn't shoot it, that had to be PG-13, yeah. they said, well, you can't do this. You, it just defeats the purpose. So it was, it was ironic that this, uh, this studio that was interested in essentially a humanitarian, mm -hmm. films with a humanitarian impulse, kept this story, yeah. which is really so much about conscience, um, uh, from being made for such a long time. So there was that, that was one of the, the challenges. I think the other is kind of inherent, not to m turn Desmond into, Desmond Doss, the character, into a secular saint. Mm. Um, oh, well, you know, God was on his side, so of course it was gonna turn out well. 
Well, you know, a, a story like that is completely uninteresting because that's not really how faith works. Um, so my impetus throughout uh, the writing and then production was to, to maintain the strength of this notion that there's no given here, that, that Desmond, yes, has faith, but it's sorely and tremendously tested as it must inevitably have been. He must have been frightened. He must have been angry. He must have been awfully tempted to pick up a gun. Mm. Our production process was incredibly fast, by contrast. You know, we, went, we, we were greenlit at every stage very quickly, and um, we got almost no bum notes. Uh, we, we, we thought that the ending of the film particularly would be a very hard sell, mm. um, because, you know, uh, spoiler alert, it ends with the <laughs> extinction of humanity, but it's a happy ending yeah. um, for a given value of happy. It's, it's the best outcome you could have um, from those, uh, those circumstances, and we, we, we were afraid that, uh, that we would be asked to change that, but we weren't. Um, the only bum note was about Sergeant Parks' death and about Melanie's response to it. Um, there were, there were one of the production partners wanted Melanie to be a little more feral and ruthless at the end, which would have been terrible. <laughs> yeah. So, so 10 years, over a decade, and over those 10 years, how many drafts were there? Uh, multiple drafts with multiple directors. Mm. You know, I, I, we would get somebody interested, I would do a draft with them, we would try to see if we could nudge the studio to a much more reasonable position, and they wouldn't, and we'd lose the director. How did you both approach the action scenes? Was that something you went over with the director? Were there on-set rewrites? How, how did that work? Well, I, I, I think it's you know, our job to be as thorough and detailed uh, uh, as possible in terms of what the script uh, contains. Then, of course, you get on the set and uh, the location is different, uh, both positive and, and negative. Um, you've got Mel Gibson, whose uh, you know, action is kind of where he lives, uh, as well as an extraordinary um, uh, crew um, in terms of special effects and stuntmen, and people are going to improvise m in the moment. That's mm -hmm. what you want. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, where, where we wound up was, mm, you know, I would say maybe 35, 40% me, another 30% uh, Andrew Knight, who was the second writer on this, and, uh, and the balance uh, Mel. Um, it was a pretty organic e experience. Mm -hmm. A lot of the sort of the big set piece action scenes, um, I left to Colin to sort of choreograph as, as, as he uh, as he saw fit. The two scenes that we talked about most, that we argued about most, and that we sort of um, thrashed out in the most detail are the scene where uh, in, in, in Colbo's laboratory where Melanie is about to be dissected, so the dissection of a child, and the scene toward the end of the movie where one child beats another to death. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about how you would realize that on screen, how you would do it in a way that wasn't gratuitous, that would, um, that would sort of um, keep the audience engaged but not be offensive or um, over the top. Do you have a favorite scene? Uh, I, I love, um, I, I create a, a whole mystery around the notion of why Desmond Doss refuses to pick up a gun. Mm -hmm. It's not intrinsic to his uh, religion, Seventh-day Adventism, and it, it's something that nobody can wrap their heads around. And so there is a kind of mystery as, you know, why, why does he insist on this one thing? And, and so there is, uh, so all this is very deliberately constructed to culminate in a scene at the end of the first horrific day of battle where Desmond is sharing a foxhole with the soldier in the platoon who had been up until this moment really his principal opponent, mm -hmm. the, the leader of the opposition to him, a bully, and uh, physically beating him up. And, and by this time, the two men have s clocked each other during the day's action and recognized, oh, well, he really does seem mm -hmm. to know what he's doing. So there's a kind of grudging respect and a admiration even growing even friendship, and it's the evolution of that friendship in this moment where they begin to open up to each other about their, their past and what brought them here. And this is the moment in which Desmond reveals why he doesn't yeah. pick up a gun, and it's to the, to the person, the one person at the beginning of the film you would think he would never do that, and, and who has become his friend. And then at the immediate scene ends with the death of that individual 
in the counteroffensive. So it's a, it's, I love what the scene does, and I love how it's been constructed to bring us up there and then how we're slammed out of it. Mm -hmm. There's a character in Girl with All the Gifts, Caroline Caldwell, who's played by Glenn Close. Um, she's a, a scientist who is um, absolutely driven, absolutely dedicated to what she's doing, to her mission, which is saving humanity. So you could see her as an idealist, except that in order to do this, she is quite happy vivisecting children. Uh, and throughout, she refuses to accept that Melanie is a child. She says they present as children, but they're fungal colonies. They're, 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 they've been completely taken over by the pathogen. Um, and there's a scene at the end where Melanie gets to talk back to Caldwell and to force Caldwell to acknowledge her as a human mm. being. And that's my favorite scene. Mm. Quite similar, actually, in a way. Two very important relationships coming to, yeah, to a climax. Mm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what's been the best reaction? that you've encountered personally to the film? When we screened uh, the movie for the first time, uh, it was at the Venice Film Festival. And um, it's at this enormous, beautiful theater on the Lido. And um, the movie ended, and the audience stood up and applauded for 10 minutes. Mm. 10 wow. minutes. And Mel and I and the actors were seated in the back, and, and the audience not only stood up, but then they turned to face us while they applauded and cheered. And eventually, we just walked down and shook hands and, and <laughs> embraced people. I, I was, it was the most extraordinary reaction to a movie I've ever had in my life. Wow. For us, it would have been Toronto, Midnight, Midnight Madness. So we had a screening that started at midnight, finished uh, close to 2 a.m., we had a little break, and then we had a Q&A at 2 in the morning, which finished at 3. And then we spilled out on the streets, and everybody stayed, and we just carried on <laughs> chatting to people on the pavement, which was incredible. Yeah. Nobody wanted to go home. How do you approach character? To me, it's a, it's a game about what you reveal, what you, what you hide, and what you ultimately share, and how you share it. Um, I, what I'm always interested in, the projects that always attract me, are characters character-driven projects, regardless of what the genre is, um, in which the, the internal conflicts are at least as great as the external conflicts. That, that to me, is what, what attracts me to a story and to a character. Mm -hmm. I, I, I fret about voice. I, I never feel like I've got a character until I get the voice right, so I'll often sort of have it's crazy dialogues yeah. in, in a notebook. I'll just write my own lines and then their lines until mm -hmm. the voice comes clear. And um, there's a trick that actually Colin taught me, which is really useful, which is find the most admirable thing about your unsympathetic characters and find the most contemptible things about the characters we're meant to like. And make sure, even if they don't come into the story, mm -hmm. make sure you know them, make sure you know what that is, yeah. so that you've got a kind of counterbalance. Mm -hmm. um, so both of you have a history writing in other forms, so plays, uh, graphic novels, prose. What was the transition like when you first started writing for screen? It's incredibly hard mm. for me um, because I thought that comics, I thought the film screenplays would work like comic scripts because they look a little bit like comic scripts and there's, there's a vast difference. The two things are poles apart. Mm. And when, when you're writing a comic script, you can basically be the director. You can specify everything, uh, the, the camera angle for every shot. You can tell the artist exactly what you want, which you can't do in a screenplay. You've got to be a little bit more imagistic. Yeah. Um, comic scripts are incredibly explicit. Yeah. Um, screenplays are incredibly terse. Uh, th th those, were, those are the things that sort of tripped me up at first. Mm. Uh, well, I started uh, writing for the theater uh, originally. Um, and then uh, began also to write for television and film. And, uh, and, and now I write for all three and I bounce back and forth. I, I, honestly, to me, it's all storytelling. And, uh, and, I, and I never felt it was, uh, I, I never struggled um, so much moving one to the other. There's a um, uh, exercise that kids get set in schools sometimes, which is make um, a load-bearing structure out of paper and then balance a, like a, a glass or a mug on it and see if it'll hold the weight. Um, I think one of, one of the things about film that it took me a long time to realize is that every single line is load-bearing. It, it all has to, mm -hmm. it, that's not true of comics and it's not true of novels. Novels can be as discursive as you like and it won't be seen as a fault.
What was the hardest scene to write? I think the dissection, the dissection scene, um, both in the novel and in the screenplay, because it's so, it's so awful. What's happening is so awful, and um, it kind of, you know, it, it doesn't play out. There's a moment where just, you know, um, Gemma Arterton intervenes, and, so that's, and, and that's the beginning, right? In that yeah. Facility. But it's uh, when, I, when I was writing it, um, I had to stop quite frequently and go away and do something else because I was getting, I was actually getting mm. upset, mm. very emotionally upset. I think the challenge uh, in the heroics on the battlefield <coughs> is, um, you know, it's a repetitive action. Mm. Yeah. He sees a soldier. <laughs> he, he, there are difficulties getting yeah. to him because of the Japanese who are hunting him. Somehow he has to get to the soldier and get him to the edge of the cliff and let him down, and repeat. So how do you make that different and interesting, interesting and challenging? And that that was uh, that was fun to uh, uh, to work on, but definitely a challenge. Mm. So Desmond saved 75 people, right? Well, that's the official uh, record. There are people who say he saved uh, upwards of 100 or more. Um, yeah, I read that it, the film was not, not toned down, but there was a concern that people might not believe how incredible the acts. We left things out. We left yeah. things out that, uh, I mean, after, after the events that we recount in the film, Desmond um, is wounded. Uh, shot um, and crawls back to the medic station uh, using a broken rifle stock uh, to get himself there and then binds himself and goes back out on the battlefield. He is then wounded again, this time by a grenade. So he's picked up and put on a stretcher and as they're carrying him back, he sees another wounded American soldier. He insists on getting off the stretcher and then putting him on the stretcher and waiting for to somebody else to come get him. I mean, you know, he just, uh, so some of these you just, there just wasn't time and we also thought we might strain credulity yeah. uh, with it. How important is resilience as a screenwriter? It's like you said, t t 10 years, how did you keep the faith? I work, you know, I look at it as a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. I'm working all the time mm. and um, uh, I'm so used to, to the fits and starts and vagaries of Hollywood. Um, I, I may just now be having your extraordinary blessed uh, experience of writing it and, and it just happens very quickly. I may, may be having that this year for the first time in my life. I never stop pushing. I, never, I think part of the screenwriter's job is to also function as a producer and to to try everything you can to support the movie down the path. But, um, you know, you have to distance yourself emotionally at a certain level in, in terms of that. It's just too frustrating otherwise. Mm. Mm. That's true. I, I think um, what, what I do is that I just, if, 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 if one thing is stalled, I jump sideways onto another project and usually into another medium. So you know, if, if I'm not making any progress on a screenplay, I'll spend a couple of days working on a chapter of whatever novel I've got on the go, or an issue of a comic book or so on. Um, so there's, there's, there's always something that I can apply myself to, and at a certain point, I'll be able to go back mm -hmm. and uh, proceed. So it's not so much resilience as um, I just allow myself to be distracted onto other things, yeah. and then come back when the time is right. Uh -huh. And I actually, I actually find that, because I do the same thing, I actually find that helpful, the, the distance. When I set a project aside, I go away and do something else, and then I come back, to the, to, the, to the previous project, I find that I have a little bit more clarity, a little bit yeah. more objectivity. And if, the, if I was hitting a speed bump, I'm able to move past it somehow. I, I used to have terrible days where I couldn't focus and I'd just play Sonic the Hedgehog, I'd play, play eight, <laughs> 80s, 80s video games and I'd feel incredibly guilty about it yeah. until I realized that actually it's part of the, it's part of the mechanism of getting your brain <laughs> working. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, it's kind of like, it's the way, the way you know, there's, if there's a word on the tip of your tongue, yeah. and you forget about it, 20 minutes later, uh. it pops up like toast. It's that, you know, when, 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 you, when you do something that's not directly connected to work, there's a part of your brain, a subroutine. Still working. It's still yes, thinking. That's right, yeah. that's right. Uh. Yeah. Do you have any advice for aspiring writers or upcoming writers? Well, um, what I always say is uh, that it is a marathon, it's not a sprint, mm -hmm. um, and, and to just do the work. Um, and keep your head in the work and, and don't be distracted or defeated by the speed bumps that you will in, invariably uh, I encounter. Um, keep your focus uh, on the work. 
I think um, you can't be a creator unless you're an enthusiastic consumer of the thing you're creating. You've got to love film enough to watch and watch and watch um, and think about what it is that you love, uh, what works for you and what doesn't. Um, and I think uh, get as many opinions as you possibly can on your work, especially unfavorable mm -hmm. opinions. Don't ask your mum. Ask people who are going to be honest with you and mm -hmm. tell you what you're doing wrong. So that's the only way you can sort of, it gives you a rear view mirror, you can see into your blind spots. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.